Two and a Half Admins, episode 18. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. And before we get started, you want to plug your webinar again, Alan? Yeah. Uh, so the first webinar is out and you can watch it uh, now on our website. That's the best practices for optimizing ZFS. And then we just had the second one when we're recording this, I guess that's Wednesday, on uh, Sysadmin's Guide to ZFS. It's a little more beginner oriented. So if you find the first one a little too over your head, then the second one will be more to your liking. That's not on our website yet, but it'll be there before too long. Well, I look forward to that. Yeah, stay tuned there. Though. We'll be announcing another one for January soon. Cool. So let's do some news then. The first one is from Cloudflare again. This time, I think it's positive. I don't know. You'll have to correct me if I'm wrong. The blog post is titled Improving DNS Privacy with Oblivious DOH in 1.1.1.1. This is a new approach to DNS over HTTPS using a proxy in the middle between your machine and the DNS server. So with the proxy in the middle, the idea is that you will send the query to the proxy who will then send it on to the actual DNS server uh, on your behalf so that the server doing the lookup won't actually know who's asking. So it means if you, uh, like many people should, don't trust Cloudflare to know everything everybody's looking up. Uh, this way they won't know who is doing the lookup, only the proxy will. And if that's somebody other than Cloudflare, it allows you to do the lookup without any one party knowing all of it, the different uh, bits. The part that we didn't quite cover here is that the entire thing is encrypted and the, the proxy, the man in the middle, doesn't actually have the ability to decrypt it. So Cloudflare can decrypt your uh, your query, but they don't know what IP it came from because the proxy's in the middle. And the proxy knows what your IP is, but doesn't know what DNS record you're asking for. Right. But what you're trusting here also is that there is no actual relationship between the proxy and between, you know, the actual resolver. If there is one, then they can just, you know, talk to each other and share data and you're pwned anyway. But you can self-host that proxy. Well, if you self-host it, then, you know, now they know the IP because it's yours because you're hosting it. Right. But the idea is that there uh, there's some other partners that will be hosting these proxies, like apparently Equinix and PC, CW, et cetera. Uh, and, you know, I'm sure a bunch of privacy focused organizations will stand some of these up. I'm still not sure it means that DOH is actually a good idea, but why not? Well, I guess my problem isn't with the protocol or anything. It's more with, you know, I'm not sure I want my browser deciding which DNS it should use instead of doing what my operating system tells it to do. Of course, that assumes I control my operating system, which, you know, in, in your Linux or BSD case makes sense. Uh, but, you know, on your phone, you don't really easily control what your DNS server is. Or on your Windows PC, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, on my Windows one, it does what I tell it to do. But with traditional DNS, also, I could enforce that at the firewall. My firewall won't let you talk to any DNS server except for mine. And so no matter what the OS tried to do, it couldn't. But DOH was meant to work around that. Sometimes that makes sense, but sometimes it doesn't. I still don't think that really has much to do with DOH, the protocol, though. It has no. more to do with the browser usurping features that should be much lower in the stack. And the major browsers were doing that prior to DOH. You know, Chrome and Firefox both tended to ignore, you know, your, the contents of EtsyResolve.conf and just kind of do their own thing before DOH was a glimmer in anybody's eye. Right. I guess the, the big thing with DOH was just because it's designed to be indistinguishable from the regular HTTPS traffic, it makes it harder from the network level to exercise control over what's happening on your network. Which, you know, when it's your network, that's what you want. It's like, this is my house, I want to control the network. When you're using your telco's network, you kind of wish they didn't have the control. And so I can see the, the tension in both directions. I just don't like the idea of, of losing control over what the things on my network get to do. My house is a fascist state and I'm the dictator. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, you know, get rid of that terrible Windows PC and get a proper Linux box and uh, talk to Phelan from uh, Late Night Linux about uh, getting your proper F-Droid phone and you'll be sorted. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Windows isn't the problem in this case. But this is a definite improvement to DOH, right? Well, it's eh. an extension of it anyway. It may be useful. I remember DNS over TLS and the, what, the DNS crypt or whatever and, you know, using random proxies to do the lookups. Like we did an, a tutorial on that in BSD Now in like 2013. I don't know if the browser vendors are in the right frame of mind to be making the decisions for me about if I need my privacy protected. Like I understand 
having those features and options is one thing, turning them on when people don't understand them. I don't know if that's as good a thing. And is there a false sense of security as well here? Yeah, I think uh, especially for DOH, you know, they, they keep trying to say, oh, this is to protect people in Iran from the government. I'm like, this isn't going to protect Telling them that it will is going to end very badly for some of these people. Yeah. If you're dealing with state level actor, nothing Firefox does is going to save you. And so don't be lulled into a sense of security like that. You need to do a lot more than pick a browser. So basically what this stuff could at least in theory do is it just it ups the cost a little bit of surveilling somebody. It makes it a little bit more difficult to have like a really inexpensive, easy, massive sweep of like what everybody's doing because you're just listening and it's free. It makes you have to care more about, you know, trying to find out what some individual is doing. But if you get the idea that like, oh, hey, you know, I can just give the FBI the middle finger. They can't get me. I'm using ODOH. No, no, that, that that's not how this works. Yeah, this is Privacy on the angle of stopping your ISP from aggregating information and selling it, not from stopping, you know, law enforcement and state actors and so on. And, you know, again, I, I, I do think that Cloudflare has the right. Uh, I, I don't hate them as much as Joe does. Um, I really I don't I don't hate them at all. I, I, I don't think that they have like the, the wrong thoughts in mind here. But just the fact that when they're describing this, they talk about their partners that operate the proxy, like that really says to me that they haven't thought this crap all the way through. Like the, those, the whole idea here is there has to be a separation between the resolver and the proxy. And when you're describing the operators of the proxy as your partners, you've just undermined the entire concept and that, that it has clearly sailed right by them. So, you know, eh. For the record, I don't hate them. I'm just suspicious of them. Oh, I hate them. But anyway. <laughs> um, for me, I think it's definitely like when I saw this ODOH stuff, I'm like, okay, so this is them trying to address people's fear that, you know, Cloudflare is just getting all this information instead of Google or my ISP. And this does help with that. But like Jim said, I want a list of these proxies that also hate Cloudflare. Yeah. <laughs> and wouldn't give them anything. That kind of thing. I think my biggest concern with... DOH and this stuff is just we're more and more concentrating the internet. Like if we think back to when the internet was more open, right? As like every little ISP operated their own DNS resolver as a service to the customer. And it meant that you had a local DNS server that was near you and it was fast. And there was a lot of them. But now it's like Comcast uses only a small number for their entire massive network or but with the DOH, it's like, all right, you can use, you can choose between Google, Cloudflare, or somebody else, and that's it. And, you know, if Cloudflare goes down, which they do a couple times a year, as it turns out, it takes out like a third of the websites on the internet, and now my DNS doesn't work. Yeah, and if you're unlucky, a big bit of AWS also goes out, and then that's the, another third of the internet gone out. Yeah, and then the Google Compute Cloud takes out the other one. So, yeah. you know, one day of the week or the next, one of the services isn't working because everything is in one of these, like, five fiefdoms. And, you know, I really liked it better when the internet was... Everybody did their own infrastructure, and it meant that the common mode failures were much more rare. Whereas now, it's like, you know, you have your Facebook, Google, uh, Amazon, Cloudflare, and that's what there is. And if, you know, the other thing is, like, we're going to get to the point where denial of service attacks get so big that if you're not using one of those four, then you're just not going to be able to use the internet. And it just seems we really don't want to be going this way. I think it's a little overstated. I mean, to be fair, you know, going back to those golden days you're harking at, like literally no site hardly ever survived just being on the front page of Slashdot. Right. Whereas now, you know, getting Slashdotted is laughable, not only because Slashdot's, you know, traffic is lower. It's not that much lower. It's just that, you know, now most everybody does have a CDN. You know, they, they can survive these kind of things a lot more. And it's because, you know, this kind of infrastructure has become a lot more available, a lot further down the stack. Before we move on from this, I do want to mention one other thing, though. Um, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about the idea of state actors in ODOH, and I would like to point out that, A, a state actor has a lot more ways to get your data than just snooping your DNS. But even on just the snooping the DNS level, if you're worried about somebody that, you know, is an actual state actor, anybody who could have issued a subpoena to Cloudflare to get Cloudflare's information 
Well, they can issue two, you know, they can they can subpoena PCCW Global and Cloudflare and get both sides, the proxy and the resolver and put the pieces together. It's not that freaking hard. This is not exactly Tor here. Yeah, you are making it a little bit harder for them by having two. But again, it's very incremental. And like Jim said, it's not going to stop them. It just makes it a little bit harder. This really is only solving the problem of your ISP aggregating and selling advertising data or whatever about what websites you go to. A very tiny bit harder. If it's somebody that can issue a subpoena, it is not really any harder to subpoena two entities than one. And they're not going to just pick the two you use. They're going to subpoena Cloudflare and every one of the proxies. (laughs) Because it's in their interest to make it really annoying for the proxies. Okay, this episode is sponsored by TrueNAS from iX Systems. Go to truenas.com. TrueNAS and FreeNAS have now unified as TrueNAS, the number one open storage OS. TrueNAS uses the power and reliability of OpenZFS to bring open source economics to enterprise grade unified storage with support for file, block, object, and app storage. You can use the free TrueNAS Core Edition or invest in a TrueNAS Enterprise system. Coming soon is TrueNAS Scale, which provides open hyperconverged infrastructure with support for Linux containers, and you can follow the development, try out, and contribute to this exciting project. Check out truenas.com and see how TrueNAS can support your next storage project, whether it's just a few terabytes all the way up to multiple petabytes. That's truenas.com. All right, well, let's talk about OpenZFS 2.0 that has been released in the last couple of weeks. And you had something to do with this, Alan. I wrote one of the, the headline features, I guess. Uh, most of it, anyway. But, you know, this is basically all the development that's happened in ZFS in the last year and a half or so is is basically what 2.0 is. Although, you know, there's already been new features added since 2.0. Uh, the DRAID stuff has landed and DirectIO is under construction right now. And the RAID-Z expansion is also uh, going to have its next alpha or beta or whatever before the end of the year. So lots of good stuff happening in ZFS. But 2.0 is the official release. It means that it'll be uh, easy for people to get their hands on. You know, it's available in the FreeBSD ports tree now, uh, and you can get it on some Linuxes, although, you know, it's not going to be built into a Linux release like Ubuntu until their next LTS. Well, it'll be before the LTS, right? But no one's really going to use Ubuntu that isn't an LTS. I don't know how that'll line up, you know, uh, for FreeBSD, it lined up a bit better. Our next big release is in March, but even that is likely to ship 2.1 rather than 2.0 uh, in order to pick up that DRAID feature. Most likely over on the Ubuntu side, we'll, we'll be seeing it uh, showing up in 21.10, but in 21.10, uh, the you'll probably see it backported from there to the last LTS as well, to 20.04, would be my guess. Yeah, one of the point releases. Yeah. Yeah, which is by 21.10... Uh, I'm sure we'll be at 2.2 or 2.3 or something, and we'll actually be in the release process for 3.0, which, you know, the timing may end up working out kind of unfortunately, and I wonder if there's maybe uh, a way to solve that. Uh, I don't know how soon, you know, OpenZFS 3.0 would have to come out in order to make sure it lines up to be ready for the next uh, Ubuntu LTS. So is this arbitrary then, this major version number? Slightly. Uh, it, part of it is a change from... You know, before ZFS on Linux was 0.6, 0.7, 0.8, there were a couple of reasons to go to 2.0. The first was it's now the same code on FreeBSD and Linux. Uh, So that was a big part of it. But also the plan now is to do a full major version uh, once a year. So we should see 3.0 at the end of 2021 and so on. And then the minor versions uh, will be, you know, incremental releases. Man, that feels rapid. A new major version number every year. It was mostly to make it possible to tell where you are along the chain, especially in the past FreeBSD and Lumos didn't have a version number for ZFS per se. And so it was like, what version do you have compared to uh, a Linux or whatever? In this way, it will be easier to, to tell. It's interesting for ZFS to end up back at version numbers when we, you know, originally ZFS had version numbers for the pool and for the file system. And then... We got away from that because of the way development happens in open source. It means different features come to different people in different order. And so the feature flags made more sense. But now we wrap those up into a release with a version number again. It's uh, kind of interesting to have gone all the way one direction and then kind of back the other. 
So clearly, this is just marketing versioning numbers. If we're talking about, you know, a new major version every year, we're not talking semantic versioning because a major version, you know, means incompatible API changes. That would be disastrous every year. It depends. So prior to OpenZFS 2.0, the ABI for things like libzfs was not guaranteed at all. So even between like 0.7.10 and 0.7.11, it could change. One side of this is solved by the compatibility layers we already have. So you can use newer or older ZFS command line tools with a different version of the kernel module, and they will communicate what they don't support. And so there's less chance of problems there. But the idea is that we'll actually keep a stable ABI on the 2.x branch for, say, libzfs and so on. Uh, so the if you're programmatically dealing with ZFS uh, via the library, the symbols there aren't going to change it from underneath you. But on the major versions, that's when we would be able to add new interfaces or, or more importantly, change the existing ones. So in terms of features then, what is the average user going to gain from this upgrade? Fast rebuilds and Z standard compression are the big things, really. And by I should say fast resilvers. Uh, we're getting sequential resilvering, which is going to be a big deal for a lot of people. So when you have a drive fail out of out of a VDEV, it will take uh, less time and you know less wear and tear on your other drives to get it resilvered. Because basically now you'll be getting the best of both worlds between ZFS's traditional resilvering, which was great compared to traditional RAID because it didn't bother groveling over dead areas of the disk. It only cares about you know places where you have live current data. So that might in theory make it a lot faster. But in practice. Conventional RAID rebuilds tended to be faster because most people keep their arrays pretty full. And although a traditional RAID rebuild goes over every single block of the disk, whether you're using it or not, it does so in a very sequential manner, whereas ZFS, you know, hopped all over the place. Well, now with sequential resilvering, you're, you're kind of getting both things. You're not having to grovel over dead areas of the disk, and you're groveling over the stuff that you do need in a pretty sequential fashion so it still goes quickly. So that's going to be a big deal. And then the other thing will be, you know, Alan's work, Z-standard compression, that's going to be a, a pretty significant improvement for a lot of people over LZ4. Yeah, and mostly the advantage with Z-Standard is getting more flexibility. You know, With LZ4, there was one level of compression. With GZIP, there were nine, but they weren't all that different in the end. But with Z-Standard, we basically give you 40 levels, uh, a bunch in the fast category and a bunch in the regular. Uh, and those scale from like Z-Standard 1 being like a gigabyte per second down to Z-Standard 19 being like four megabytes a second. And you can really decide how much time you want to spend compressing stuff. I truly cannot wait for the wildly uninformed commentary on the magical correct level of Z-standard compression everybody's supposed to use. So the interesting thing with the resilver stuff is that we had this other thing that we called re sequential resilver before that was, that's been available for a while. And that was... So normally when you do a resilver, ZFS walks through the tree of blocks and figures out what it needs to resilver. And in the traditional version, it just did them in that order, which was very random. Then we got the kind of semi-sequential resilver. And what that did was built up a list of what it needed to do uh, in a block of memory, like a couple hundred megabytes of memory. And then when that list got full, it took the biggest contiguous chunk of that and went and did that work and then went back to filling it in so that you would at least somewhat do it in in uh, a sequential order because it's a lot faster even on SSDs but especially on hard drives to read a whole bunch of blocks in order rather than to do them completely scattered. What this one does is uses only the space map to just know which blocks are or have data and which ones don't and just copies from the other side of the mirror and does the whole drive from start to beginning just skipping over the empty space. The downside to that is you can't check the checksum when you do that because you, you haven't walked through the block tree, so you don't actually know what the checksum of each block is. But since this is mostly, uh, or this only works for mirrored VDEVs, in most cases a mirror is two disks, and if one has failed and that's the one you're resilvering, you only have the other disk to copy from anyway, so having the checksum wasn't going to make a difference in what you were going to do anyway. So it does the quickly copy all the data off the good mirror to the, the replacement disk. Then it triggers a scrub to go back and check the checksums of all those blocks. The advantage to doing it this way, even though it technically is going to take longer because you know the scrub is going to take this long and the resilver uh, is fast, but you know doing both is going to take longer. But the difference is by doing the quick copy first, it means if the other half of your mirror now does die, 
you have most of the data saved. Maybe if there was a checksum error, you're going to find it, but it's going to be one block. Whereas if you did the old one, you only got halfway through before the other disk died, you don't have the other half of your data. So it gets you to the safer condition much faster, then goes back and ensures 100% correctness. And so it's nicely backed up on your mirror, hey? Yes. Well, you know, RAID <laughs> is not a backup. Right? Jim will tell you this. Yes, as we said last time, yes. But this way you get from being degraded to back to having full parity much quicker, you know, a couple of hours to just whatever time it takes to read all the data off the remaining disk and copy it to the new disk. Then you do the slower reconstruction to make sure everything is correct after. Most of the time, it's not going to find anything wrong. And importantly, in the meantime, you're back to being safe instead of being, you know, it reduced redundancy until it finishes. Also, like, let, let's let's back up a little bit and, you know, kind of discuss the fact that if a scrub did determine that you had corrupt blocks on the remaining half of your mirror, that's all you have. Like, I mean, there's there you don't have any other options here. Exactly. That's the only copy you got. So you might as well go ahead and mirror that and then figure out whether it was bad or not, you know, afterwards. Exactly. It's not like if you'd known that first, you could have done something about it. You can't. Your <laughs> your mirror's degraded. Your one copy is 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 broken, exactly. On the other hand, if you're talking about like a three-way mirror and you know, a, a more serious setup in, in business somewhere, and you've got three wide mirrors and you know, you've got two remaining discs in your three wide VDEV then sure, you might potentially copy a block that was corrupt on, you know, one of your remaining mirrors and not the other one. But you've got plenty of time to figure that afterwards with your scrub. Again, it's it's not hurting anything. That's already an issue that you had and you'll have to fix. And it's not any more broken because you've replicated it onto another disk. Your worst case scenario is, you know, you try to read from that three wide VDEV that, you know, you've copied a bad block and not the good block because you hadn't done the scrub and you hadn't read the checksum. And then you read it again before the scrub happened. Well, if you do that read and it comes from that disk that you replicated that bad block unknowingly to because you couldn't check the checksum, you know what it's going to do? It's going to check, check the, the checksum, checksum and it's going to quietly correct it from the disk in that three wide mirror that did still have a good copy of it, just like it always would have. Exactly. So there is no additional danger here. If anything, honestly, I'm a little iffy about the idea of automatically triggering that scrub because I'm like, man, I, I don't, I don't need you to do that. I've got... I've got regular scrubs scheduled anyway, and, you know, that can just get picked up in the normal scrub. I don't need you to stick another one in the rotation. Yeah, I think because it's not a resilver scrub, you probably can just cancel it with uh, ZFS scrub dash S. Yeah, I just don't want to have to. Um, we should also note, by the way, it, it should be fairly clear from context by now, but this, the new sequential resilver that we're talking about is only applicable to mirror VDEVs, not to RAID Z. Right. Uh, it is applicable to DRAID. Um, but we'll have to talk about that some other day. Yeah, <laughs> another day. I guess the other other big feature uh, that was also included in 2.0 was the persistent L2 arc. Before, if you had an L2 arc, so you know you have your memory cache, and as that gets full, it can write stuff out to a faster SSD uh, to read from. But on a reboot, it just pretended that SSD was empty and filled it up again because the L2 arc relies on in the arc having a pointer saying, "Hey, this block isn't in cache anymore, but it is on this SSD at this block." So the L2 arc now has a pair of linked lists that it uses to be able to rebuild on reboot. So if you reboot, it will recreate all those pointers in the arc. Uh, and so a couple of minutes after you reboot, uh, your cache will be warm again instead of not. Which basically means for the first time, L2 arc might conceivably be useful to most normal people, whereas before it, honestly, it was not. There were always some workloads that could benefit from L2 arc, but they were far more infrequent than most people assumed. Because as Alan mentioned a little bit, the L2 arc actually feeds from the arc. Um, L2 arc is not arc itself. It's a simple ring buffer, and it feeds from basically the least useful back end of the arc. You know, the blocks that are the closest to becoming evicted because nobody's used them in a long time. So if you're on a relatively normal system that, you know, might get rebooted every few days, the odds that you're going to accumulate something in L2 arc that will be useful in only those short couple of three days before you reboot it, eh, not that great. Whereas theoretically, at least with a persistent L2 arc and a large L2 arc VDEV, you might actually, you know, be able to accumulate a serious amount, you know, of working cash on that relatively fast solid state VDEV that you'll then be able to rely on, you know, for days or weeks to come, which you really kind of need that long-term persistence to make L2 arc maybe be worthwhile. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Linode. 
Go to lino.com slash two and a half to get started with $100 free credit. Whether you're working on a personal project or managing enterprise infrastructure, Linode offers simple, affordable, and accessible cloud computing solutions that allow you to take your project to the next level. Simplify your cloud infrastructure with Linode's Linux virtual machines and develop, deploy, and scale your modern applications faster and more easily. Linode has 11 global data centers and provides 24-7, 365 human support with no tiers or handoffs regardless of your plan size. In addition to shared and dedicated compute instances, you can use your $100 credit on S3-compatible object storage, manage Kubernetes, and more. Our website is hosted with Linode, and we couldn't be happier with them. So go to linode.com slash two and a half and click the create free account button to get started. That's linode.com slash two and a half. Right, let's do some free consulting then. If you want to send your questions in for Jim and Alan, the best way is show at 2.5admins.com. Send us an email. And if you want to support creation of these episodes, you can do so on Patreon. Go to the website 2.5admins.com and there's a link there. And thank you everyone who is supporting us. It really is appreciated. And remember, for $5 or more, you can get an advert-free RSS feed, so go and check that out. So, Ralph writes in, I'd like to start installing Ubuntu Server 2004 on lots of devices. I have my own way of partitioning, and it's not ZFS, and I don't want to install it by hand manually every single time, so I'd love to automate the whole installation. Some things cannot be reconfigured later by shell scripts or Ansible, like partitioning, so the ideal situation is to handle it during the installation. Pixie with DRBL is not an option since some devices won't be connected to any network. Therefore, I need to come up with a one or two flash disk setup. The first flash disk will be the Ubuntu installer, the second something that will automate the install process. I can install it once and then back up using DD or Clonezilla, but I don't want to manage and store the gold image of the installed system. Also, I really like the idea of an install script that might have some if conditions that would handle different types of hardware. Is the disk bigger than X? Is the device a laptop, etc.? Based on my research, I found the following options, either a Red Hat Kickstart installation, Debian Preseed, or just boot the Ubuntu server, control Alt and F2, and run something that will start the installation. Can you please tell me what option I should choose and ideally point me to some examples? Personally, my answer would be Kickstart. Um, Ubuntu supports Kickstart directly, and it does everything that you've said that you wanted to do. Uh, it's it's relatively simple. I haven't done much with it. I've gotten my feet a little wet with it in the past, but basically I haven't had to do enough installs to make it worth maintaining the kickstart uh, for, for my own uses. It, it just ended up being better to, to just, you know, know my installation procedure like the back of my hand and, you know, run through it manually every time. Uh, but if you have a greater scale than I've needed to work with, uh, uh, write a Kickstart script and you're off to the races. Yeah. Uh, at Scale Engine, we use Kickstart as well. Uh, we have CentOS for uh, video transcoding machines because and video drivers uh, for the encoding stuff. Uh, you know, The commercial software was the only thing they supported. Kickstarter worked pretty well. We had to do like 30 or 40 machines, uh, a lot of those relatively close together, but each one was also slightly different. The only thing we really had a pain was trying to do like, hey, we need to configure these two these two specific interfaces to be in link aggregation, and then we need to put a VLAN on top of that. And doing that on Linux is terrible. If you've ever had to do it on BSD, you're used to it being very easy and getting Kickstarter to, to do it correctly, reliably was a pain, but uh, once you neuter network manager and so on, it seems to be okay. I know you said not ZFS, but the <laughs> other thing we do for installing the FreeBSD servers is we built a golden image uh, with ZFS. And the advantage to that is we then do a ZFS send to a file. And so that file doesn't need to be the whole size like a DD or Clonezilla image of a hard drive would be. It's just the stuff we installed. So it's like two gigabytes or whatever. And then we have a really small USB that, you know, you boot up the server and it can either read that uh, ZFS uh, send stream off the USB or download it off the internet. And so, you know, our install process is usually literally partition the disk, create a zpool, and then curl pipe ZFS receive. And it just slurps down the image, splats it on the disk, and then you run a script to set the host name and reboot. And now you have a FreeBSD server. 
But we even upgrade our operating system that way. We use the boot environments feature. And when it's time to upgrade, we just download a newer version of the OS, receive it as a new data set, uh, set a flag to say, on the next reboot, boot this version of the OS instead. Reboot, if that works, it becomes the default. If it doesn't, power cycle, you're back to the working version. Right, well, we'd better get out of here then. You can send your questions to show at 2.5admins.com. You can find me on Twitter at Joe Ressington. I'm at JRSSNet. And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you in two weeks.